Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you here today at Faith Bridge. So if you grew up in the South in the last 100 years, more than likely you are aware of that ubiquitous vine called kudzu, otherwise known as the vine that ate the South. With the very best of intentions, it was brought from Japan to the United States in the late 1800s for the purposes of preventing soil erosion. And it did, in fact, accomplish that purpose, but unfortunately, along the way, it also managed to devour everything in its path. It it really is a remarkable plant. I mean, the crazy stuff can grow up to a foot a night. And if left untended, it can grow from just a tiny little pod to eventually covering hundreds and hundreds of acres. No kidding. Years ago, when I was still living in Georgia, I I watched over a five-year period as a patch of kudzu managed to completely swallow an abandoned house and an adjacent junk car. You couldn't even see them anymore. You didn't know what was under there. Now, it is not completely without merit, I should say. Uh, In a pinch, it can be used as fodder for livestock. If you're running low on hay, uh, there are some People who even make uh, jam and jelly preserves out of it, and I am told that it also possesses a remarkable cure for hangovers. (laughs) But by and large, your typical Southerner looks at kudzu as just a, a nuisance and a plague. Today, we're continuing on in our sermon series, The Seven Deadly Sins, looking at the topic of anger. And I like to think of anger as the kudzu of the seven deadly sins. Because like kudzu, if left untended, it can devour our lives. It can begin to impact every single area of our lives, ultimately destroying us, our families, our careers, even our walk with God. It is dangerous, dangerous stuff. And so this morning, we want to take a good long look at this dangerous thing called anger. We want to consider where does it come from and what are some practical remedial steps that we can take to do something about it, to make sure that it does not devour our lives. To guide our thinking, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. That's in about the middle of the New Testament. It is one of the many letters therein that the Apostle Paul wrote. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. That can be yours to keep. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. While you're turning there, I'll give you just a a little bit of background. Uh, The letter to the Ephesians is different from many of the other New Testament letters in that it was not written to address a particular heresy or problem. Rather, it's just an opportunity for Paul to take a group of people to an even deeper place in their understanding of what it means to be a believer. The first half of the book leans more towards a theological understanding of our faith. The second half of the book really gets down to practicalities. We're going to be in chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. Paul writes, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Now, technically speaking, anger is not in and of itself a sin. Paul uh, understood this very well. He, He knew that anger was... Uh, a, a very normal, even unavoidable human emotion. That's why he goes to the trouble to say, in your anger, do not sin. In other words, 
Anger's going to happen, but in the process, don't fall into sin as you are angry. So there's no sin in simply being angry. But that raises the question then, why did the early church fathers choose to include anger in the so-called seven deadly sins? Well, the reason is because rare, I mean exceedingly rare, is the instance where anger is not accompanied by sin. There is this thing called righteous anger. But I doubt if I've seen it more than twice in my whole life. In Jesus and maybe in my mother. <laughs> Beyond that, almost always I see anger accompanied by sin. And so it is included in there. And strictly as an aside, I, I would point out this, in the 18 years that I've been at Faith Bridge, we've preached three sermons on anger, and all three of them have been assigned to me. <laughs> I'm not sure what that says, but at any rate, it is a reality in our lives, and it very much, if not always, has the capacity to lead us into a place of sin. So if we're going to do anything about it, I think the starting place is to first of all understand where does it come from? We, we, we've got to get to the root of the matter, just like kudzu. If you don't pull that stuff up by the roots, it's going to grow. It's going to have its way. It's going to take over. And if we don't deal with root issues related to our anger, it's not going anywhere either. It's only going to fester and grow. Now, certainly in the life of every single individual, there are all sorts of causes of anger, all sorts of situations and circumstances where anger comes about. I'm not going to attempt to address every single one of those. Instead, I want to look at two overarching causes of anger that are prevalent in our culture, right here in the good old United States of America. Two driving forces that are impacting all of us who live in this culture. They are inescapable because we do live in this culture. And the first of those is the unfortunate reality that our culture has become a place that rewards outrage. We reward anger and outrage. You know, our, our role models are not the kind, the gentle, the loving, the meek. No, if anything, those sorts of persons are declared to be the wimps, the losers, the ones that surely aren't going to be able to accomplish anything. Instead, our heroes are those who get angry and those who aren't going to be pushed around and those who are going to stand up for their rights. And the more an individual can not only generate their own anger, but arouse anger in others, the more effective they are as a leader and a hero. That's where we have come to in our culture, I am afraid. Anger and outrage is something to be lifted up and admired. The idea, the very idea of turning the other cheek if we were to be slapped is so irrelevant as to be laughable. How dare you is the mantra of our generation and our society. I'll show you. Somebody's going to pay. These are the sorts of things that are driving our lives and driving our anger. But those of us who are Christ followers, we're called to be different. We're not called to be like the culture. All throughout the New Testament, Jesus and the other writers make plain, we are foreigners, we are aliens here. We are to be going against the tide. 
And while admittedly, to varying degrees, it is impossible to be influenced by culture. I mean, it's all around us. It's going to have an impact. Nevertheless, Jesus is clear. You and I are to be different. By this, he said, everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. He didn't say, by this, people will know that you follow me that you get ticked, that you get hacked off, that you're not going to take it anymore, that you're going to put people in their place and woe to the person who gets in your way. No, by this, people will know that you're my disciple, that you love one another. We would do well, friends, you and me, to take a good long look at our lives and ask, how am I being impacted by my culture? To what degree am I buying in to this notion of outrage and anger? And that that is an acceptable way for me to live and an acceptable way for me to treat other people and an acceptable way for me to represent Christ to the world. One of the places our anger is coming from is all around us. It's our culture of outrage. A second place I think that is driving our anger is our inability and our unwillingness to suffer. Professor at U of H, Brene Brown, puts it this way. Because we have lost the capacity to suffer, we turn our pain into anger. It's so much easier to cause pain than to feel pain. Here in the latter part of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st, we have become masters at insulating ourselves from any pain, discomfort, inconvenience, certainly suffering. That's not going to be a part of our lives. And we've got all sorts of stratagems that we put in place to make sure that inconveniences and difficulties and pain don't come our way. Now, Pastor Dan, are you saying that, oh, you know, we should just run outside and look for every opportunity to suffer? No. Suffering is a part and parcel of this world. We don't have to go looking for it. The question is, what are we going to do with it when it comes? And because we have become so opposed to the very idea of suffering happening to me, when it does come our way, the instinctive response is to get angry. This should not have happened. Somebody is going to have to pay. Even though Jesus lived a life of inconvenient service to other people, even though Jesus sacrificed his very life for you and for me, Even though Jesus said to those of us who would follow him, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. When those opportunities come our way, they don't build maturity, they build resentment. They build anger that we should be in this situation. And because we have lost and are losing that capacity to suffer, especially for the good of others, anger is overwhelming our lives. When something comes along that we don't like, we get angry at God that he would permit such a thing to happen. We get angry at the people who probably caused it in our lives. And yes, unfortunately, The collateral damage extends out to the innocent bystanders. How many children in our culture have been abused because their parents never dealt with the abuse that they suffered as children? How many spouses have suffered because a husband or a wife was not willing to understand that marriage is intended to grow us up? to sanctify us. It's hard. It's going to be hard. 
Are we going to get angry about it and make our families miserable? Or are we going to learn from it and grow and become more like Jesus? That's the question. No, we don't like to be inconvenienced. And when it comes along, the quickest remedy, the easiest remedy, the one that's almost guaranteed to deliver results is to get angry, to get even. I don't recall Jesus saying anything about that. Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to lay down his life as a ransom for many. Doesn't sound like a lot of anger. If you take those two overarching causes, if you take the fact that we live in a culture of outrage and you combine it with our inability to suffer we have got one more toxic situation on our hands. And we are raising generation after generation living in an environment of toxicity. And we are losing our witness to society. We're eliminating the platform that we've had to speak peace and truth and life and hope because we've just bought right in to the spirit of the age. And assume that because everyone else was doing it, it's okay for us to do it too. Paul had a different idea. In the very same chapter we read from, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he writes these words, 1 through 3 actually. As a prisoner for the Lord, that tells us something right there. The man was in jail. Not very convenient. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Doesn't sound like a whole lot of room in there for sinful anger. So what are we going to do about it? It's there. How are we going to address it? Well, to begin with, if we're going to swim against the tide of culture, culture which has sort of a greenhouse effect on us, we're going to have to create a culture of our own, which is what Jesus intended anyway. We are to be the church, the bride of Christ. We are to be like Jesus, but here's the deal. You can't be like Jesus unless you're with Jesus. You can't expect him to rub off on you if you're never near him. And so I would ask you, how much time are you making for him these days? How much time are you meeting with him in prayer to deal with with the hurtful, angry issues of your life? How often are you in his word, allowing it to shape and transform and mold your thinking, your choices, your priorities, your values? You can't be Jesus unless you're with Jesus. And his heart's desire is that we all be little Jesuses sprinkled throughout this culture. And how frightening is the thought that the influence of Jesus would be suddenly taken away from our culture. Where in the world would it go but deeper and deeper and deeper into a cauldron of anger? No, we're called to be with Jesus that we might then go out into the world and be the salt and light, the leavening influence, the change agents that he's calling us to be. If you want to do something about the anger in your life, begin hanging around the one who knew righteous anger, never anger that was sinful. 
I think a second thing we can do is gain a little perspective. A little perspective. Namely, asking ourselves from time to time, what is so special about me? Really? I think it would do us a world of good if from time to time we took a good long look in the mirror and asked, what is so special about you? That you're outraged, that you're angry, that you're a ticking time bomb, that you're right on the edge of putting other people in their place. Our Lord was whipped and spat upon and cursed and beaten and crucified. And we're flying off the handle if somebody cuts us off in traffic. Last week, I was on my way home from a mission trip. And as I was leaving this particular country, I found myself in the usual long seemingly endlessly long immigration and customs line to get out of the country. And if ever my unsanctified self is going to manifest itself, it's going to be in that line. You'd think after, I, you know, I've, I've probably been on over 100 mission trips in my life. Probably the 30 different countries, they all send you through immigration and customs. I've never really understood why you had to show your passport to get out, but... It's just part of the deal. But just something about that brings out the worst in me. I start thinking about all the ways it could be more efficient. We could be moving along. Well, last week, I, I was not in any big rush to get to my flight. I had plenty of time. No reason at all for me to be impatient and angry, but I could feel it welling up within me. I finally get to the big yellow line that you have to stand behind. And at that moment... The officer in the booth has the nerve, the unmitigated gall, to take a restroom break. <laughs> and on the inside, I'm thinking, hey, this is me. This isn't just one of these other people here. This is me, Pastor Dan. Where are you going? I just work myself into How ridiculous. How ridiculous. The man had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, we need to look in the mirror and ask that question. What, what is so special about you? I'll tell you, nothing. Nothing. If we know Jesus, we are nothing more than sinners saved by grace. Grace that we did not deserve. And if we are deserving of anything, it is God's justice in our lives. How are we going to combat the anger? Well, we're going to be with Jesus. We're going to let him transform our lives. We're going to get a little perspective on who we are and who we are not. And then finally, I would suggest to you that we become people who choose to forgive. Choose to forgive. I say choose because it doesn't come naturally. It's a choice of the will. And the more difficult and painful and deep the injury the more difficult it is to choose. This week, this weekend, of course, we celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who spent his life trying to help us understand that the true measure of a person is not the color of their skin, but the content of their character. And because he gave his life to that Mission, he aroused more than just a little bit of anger in our culture. A tremendous amount of anger that shook our culture to its very foundations and would ultimately cost him his life. I'm sure most of us here are familiar with his story, but there may be one aspect of his story that you're not familiar with. 
And that's the influence of his father, Reverend Martin Luther King Sr., and the role that would play in the life of his son. MLK Sr., otherwise known to his church and the larger Atlanta community where I grew up as Daddy King, pastored at the Ebenezer Baptist Church for 40 years. In April of 1968, his son, his namesake, was senselessly murdered in Memphis, Tennessee by James Earl Ray. Most of us know that. What we may not know is that just six years later, on a Sunday morning at Ebenezer Baptist Church, as his wife, Alberta, sat playing the organ as she did Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, a man by the name of Marcus Chenault walked in that church and shot her dead. If any man on the planet had reason to be angry, to want revenge, to go the way of hatred, surely it would be the Reverend Martin Luther King Sr. Nevertheless, just a few years before he died, in 1980, he wrote his autobiography. And in it, he wrote these words. There are two men I am supposed to hate. One is a white man, the other is black, and both are serving time for having committed murder. James Earl Ray is a prisoner in Tennessee charged with killing my son. Marcus Chenault was institutionalized as deranged after shooting my wife to death. I don't hate either one. There is no time for that and no reason either. Nothing that a man does takes him lower than when he allows himself to fall so far as to hate anyone. We can't help when we hear the story of Reverend King. We cannot help but think about the God that he so faithfully served for 40 years. Because like Reverend King, that God, our God, too lost his son, Jesus, to senseless violence, murdered by the very ones that he came to save. Murdered not just by those who condemned him, murdered not only by those who drove the nails, murdered by you and me. Because he died for us, for our sin. He took the punishment that we deserved. And though God would have been well within his rights to have exacted revenge upon each one of us, he did not do that. No, instead, three days later, he raised his son from the grave. And he extends to each one of us who desire it an opportunity to be in relationship with Him through His Son, to participate in His Son's death that our sinful person may die, and to then be raised to new life, just as Jesus was. And I would submit to you that it's in that relationship and in the growth of that relationship with Jesus that you and I become people who can say there's no time for hate and there's no time for anger.